Okay, now I've, you can see I've, uh, I hope you can see I've written here operations with fractions. So the first thing we have to do is determine what do we mean by the word operations. I should have written that a little bit lower because I can see that the light is interfering with seeing it. But if I say it, you can write it down. Operations with fractions. So we have four basic mathematical operations that you will be used to. And you know what they are already. I'm going to just put the symbols for them. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So we have four operations, four basic operations. So the first one we'll talk about is addition. Now I've explained already that addition of fractions is possible only when I have common denominators. Then I can add the numerators and keep that denominator. So we'll take an example. We'll go back to the pizza story. You ate two, ate two out of the eight pieces. Your friend ate three out of the eight pieces. And so we can add to determine how much was eaten by the two of you together. Since my denominators are the same, I can keep that denominator and simply add the numerators. So addition is simple because if I have common denominators, I simply add the numerators. So I'm going to write that rule right here. Common denominator, common denominator. Common denominators, then add numerators. And keep that denominator and keep denominator. So that's addition. Now we, we will come to other aspects of addition because there's times we want to add fractions and we don't have common denominators. But that's a topic for not right now. We're just getting the basics right now. So we won't worry about that problem. So the second thing we, we talk about is subtraction. So subtraction requires common denominators too. So common denominators apply to addition and subtraction. So let's go back to the pizza thing. So if we wanted to know who ate the most pizza, you or your friend? We can easily tell because we know you ate two pieces out of eight. Your friend ate three pieces out of eight. But what if we want to find out what is the difference between what you ate and what your friend ate? So that's a subtraction problem. So we will say, well, our friend ate three out of eight. You ate two out of eight. And we want to subtract to see what the difference is. Well, we're in good shape because our denominators are the same. So I, I can subtract and add only when denominators are the same. So I keep that denominator. I can subtract three, take away two is one. So your friend ate one more piece and that fraction is one eighth of the whole pizza. So this one means they, the friend ate one more piece, which you can see, and that's one eighth of the total fraction, the total pizza rather, is one out of the eight. So you see conceptually how the things, the fractions are talking about different things. This is talking about how much your friend ate out of the whole pizza, 
how much you ate out of the whole pizza. And this is talking about the difference between what you ate and your friend ate out of the whole pizza. So fractions allows us to talk about things in different ways that become important to our understanding. Let's talk about the next two operations. Multiply. Now we can multiply fractions and the good news is that we don't care about common denominators. We just multiply the numerators together, multiply the denominators together, and the result is our fraction when we multiply. So if we wanted to multiply, the part of the pizza you ate was two eighths. The part that your friend ate was three eighths. So we say, well, what is the product of the two pieces, portions together? So we don't have to have common denominators. So we got two times three is six, and eight times eight is 64. So together, the two of you ate six sixty-fourths of that pizza, which we could reduce to lower terms by reducing, by dividing six by two, Dividing 64 by 2, we get 3 over 32. But we won't talk about reduction right now, but that's what we would usually do. So this will be our product, because when you multiply, the result is a product. The product here is a fraction of 6 over 64. Now we could also reduce that, which we will do later reduced to what we call lowest terms. That's a concept f not for the moment, but I want you to know that it's out there and it's coming. So multiplication is actually easier than addition and subtraction in a way because we don't care about the common denominators. We just multiply numerators, get a product, multiply denominators, get a product, we're finished. So now division. Division sounds really complicated, but we'll make it easy. Now division is a two-step process. Step one, let's say we take the same pizza example. Division has two steps. And once you get to two steps, you're gonna be fine. Step one. Step one, let's say I'm gonna write the division problem, this is it, two, eight, the pizza part that you ate, divided by three, eight, what your friend ate. And we wanna know what is the answer to that division. Well, division has step one. The first step is to invert the divisor, and here the divisor is 3 8. So step one is invert, I-N-V-E-R-T. That means turn upside down, upside down. A lot of students use the word flip, which is the concept, but it's not a mathematical term. So people that would hear that would know you're not a very sophisticated math student because the concept is really inversion. Inversion means you put the denominator in the place of the numerator and vice versa. So step one is to do the inversion. So the inversion would result in two eights, the pizza that you ate, and now it's not 3 eighths, but it's 8 over 3. Because you've inverted the 3 eighths, and now it becomes 8 thirds. And step 2, which I'm going to put right here, step 2, 2, is to change the division sign to multiplication. 
then you follow the same rule you used for multiplying. So now I just multiply two times eight, I get 16. Eight times three, I get 24. So the answer to this division problem is 16 over 24. The multiplication was six over 64. The subtraction was one eighth and the addition was five eighths. So now you're gonna have time to go back over this and there will be plenty of practice on Study Island, but I'm gonna repeat them one more time just so you hear it again. Operations with fractions. There's four basic operations in math that we use repeatedly. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So to add fractions, you have to have common denominators. In our example, the denominator was eight for both. So if you have common denominators, you simply add the numerators and keep that common denominator. The same is true of division. If you have common denominators, you simply subtract the numerators and keep that denominator. Multiplication eliminates the whole discussion of common denominators because we don't care. So in this problem, we had two eights times three eights. Two times three is six. Eight times eight is 64. Now a lot of the students in the school frequently don't know their multiplication tables well enough to just multiply. So a lot of students count on their fingers, they have hash marks on their papers. So what I would say as beginning sixth graders, if you know you don't know your multiplication tables very well, the first thing for you to do is practice with some flashcards, practice in your mind, practice on paper, because the better you know your multiplication, the better you can do division, the better you can do changing fractions to percents and percents to decimals, and all of the operations in math rely on, require you to know your multiplication tables, which also helps you to do division. So now the division of fractions is two-step process. One, you invert the divisor and then you change the division sign to multiplication. So in this case, we had two eights, we left it. We changed three eights to eight over three, which is actually an improper fraction. So we took a proper fraction and made it an improper fraction and then we multiply. That's it. So now that was 13 minutes, so we're doing well. I'm gonna clean this board off and we're gonna talk about one more thing and then we're gonna stop for the day. One lazy morning, Anansi slept on a soft patch of grass. He did not hear Elephant's footsteps. Elephant felt as sleepy as Anansi, so he lay down in his favorite spot. Without looking, Elephant sat on top of Anansi. Floom! Mm, mm, mm. Anansi grumbled. Elephant lifted his head and looked around. Who's that? What's that? Mm, mm, mm. Anansi grumbled louder. Elephant felt something scratching his thick hide. He sat up to find Anansi the spider flattened by his big elephant tush. Anansi shook himself angrily until he popped back into his normal shape. Look before you sit, you clumsy ox, Anansi yelled. I am not an ox, Elephant chuckled. I am an elephant. Sorry, Anansi, you are such a little pipsqueak, I didn't see you. Who are you calling a pipsqueak, Anansi replied. Elephant looked left and right. Then he looked at Anansi. Well, since you are the only one in sight, I guess I'm talking about you, said Elephant. Anansi said, Elephant, you think you are so big and strong. I challenge you to a tug of war. Elephant laughed. <laughs> you, me, tug of war? Snort, <laughs> chuckle, chuckle. Right now I'm going to take a nap. 
elephant. I will tie a rope around your tail and go to the other end. When I pull, let the games begin, Anansi replied. Elephant just smiled and fell asleep. Anansi can be a very clever spider when he puts his mind to it. He made a long rope out of vines and tied it to Elephant's tail. Then he ran through the forest to the ocean shore. Anansi yelled over the water, Killer Whale! Killer Whale surfaced in a huge bubbling foam. Anansi, you called my name? Yes, Killer Whale. I want to ask you a question. Do you think you are the strongest creature in the water and on the earth? Killer Whale blushed and said, no, yes, I really am. Anansi replied, I believe I am more powerful than you. To prove it, I challenge you to a tug of war. Killer Whale laughed, you? Stronger than me? <laughs> That's not. Killer Whale, I will tie this rope around your top fin and go to the other end of the rope. When I pull, let the games begin, said Anansi. Let's do it, shouted Killer Whale. Anansi, I hope you're thirsty and know how to water ski. Anansi tied the rope around Killer Whale's fin. Then he ran back into the thick part of the forest. He tugged the rope as hard as he could. When Killer Whale felt the tug, he dove deep into the ocean. The taunt rope snatched Elephant from his napping place and dragged him through the forest. Elephant knocked down tree. Boom, bash, crash. The noise scared the other animals. Elephant, trying his best to regain his footing, yelled, What has Anansi been eating to give him this much strength? Elephant finally dug in and began to pull in the opposite direction. I am not going to let that spider get the best of me. Elephant ran at top speed through the forest, and when the rope pulled taunt, it pulled Killer Whale from the depths of the ocean. He was water skiing to the shore. This back and forth pulling and tugging went on for a long time. Anansi stood in the middle of the forest watching and chuckling. When both animals were too tired to move, Anansi ran to Elephant. Who is the strongest elephant? You are, Anansi. I would never have believed it. Anansi untied the rope and ran to the shore where Killer Whale was almost beached. Who is the strongest Killer Whale? You are, Anansi. I never would have believed it, gasped Killer Whale. Anansi untied the rope and walked away. He had taught Elephant and Killer Whale to be much more respectful of smaller creatures. Luckily for Anansi, they never figured out his trick. Okay, I've got this cleaned off and I'm hoping that the light is still presenting a problem, but this says fractions to decimals, percents, etc. So now I want to go into the next area with you as the introduction. We won't mention everything about these areas because they're just introductory right now but let's take your our pizza story again you ate two out of eight your friend ate three out of eight together you ate five out of eight and your friend ate one more piece than you, so that was one out of eight. And we know the whole pizza, which you probably know, if you were here, I would just ask the question, but the whole pizza would be eight out of eight. So we could look at this and say, nobody ate the whole pizza. This was two out of eight, three out of eight, five out of eight, one out of eight, eight out of eight. It's a whole pizza. So 
There we go. Now, if we have fractions, we can change a fraction into what we call a decimal, which is just another way of saying the same fraction. For example, let's take some examples of decimals. There's some examples of decimals that you already know. One half, you probably know as a decimal of 0 0.5. I think it's even 5.0 or 0.50. That's a decimal. That, that's equal to one half. So you might say, well, Dr. Whitaker, where does that come from? Well, that comes from basic division. Remember we said that this can be read as one divided by two. So if we understand one divided by two, that would look like this. One divided by two. That's what that would look like. Now I mentioned to you before, or if I haven't, I'll mention it now. Every whole number has a decimal point. If we don't see it, it's because we don't need it. But it's always secretly hidden behind the number. So one is one point nothing. But the decimal point is there. So if I want to divide two into one, I need the decimal point now, so I, I put it right up here. So in order to divide two into one, well, one is too small, so two won't go into one. So most of you already know that in order to do that division, I have to add a zero. Now I can say two goes into 10 five times. Now we usually have decimals as a general rule, we have a two place decimal. So once we have a decimal point, we have at least two numbers after it. So in order to get a second number, because you know that five times two is 10, and when I subtract now I get zero, so two won't go into zero. But to get two places, which we always would like to have with a decimal, we'd have to put another zero. Bring it down. It doesn't change anything because two won't go into zero, so we now we have a zero here. But now we know that one half, which is one divided by two, equals 0 0.50. That's our decimal. That's our decimal, so we're doing well. So now, I'm going to skip to something else that's another topic, but it's so close to our understanding right now that it's, I would be doing you a disservice not to mention it. So now we know that one half equals 0 0.50 because one divided by two turns out to be 0 0.50. So one divided by two is 0 0.50. And if you were right here, I'd ask you, well, how would you describe what this is? You would tell me that is a decimal. Now, we often want to divide a decimal, I mean, not divide, but change a decimal into a percent. So we can change this 0 0.50 into a percent, which is what we would like to do in lots of ways. So I'm gonna say percent. P-E-R-C-E-N-T. So to change 0 0.50 into a percent, I have two steps, almost like division has two steps. This has two steps. Step one is to, I'm gonna write the percent that I'm trying to change first. Here's my percent, 0.50. I wanna change that to a percent. 
it's a decimal right now, but I want to change it to a percent. So how do I do that? To change a decimal to a percent, I have step one, step one, step one. Step one is move the decimal point two spaces to the right. Move decimal, decimal point, P-O-I-N-T, two spaces to the right. So if I do that, that will be moving one space, two spaces. I'll stop here. That's step one. Move the decimal point two spaces to the right. Step two. My marker is going. Step two. Add. That doesn't work at all. Step two is add percent sign. So if I add a percent sign, I move this and it looks like this now. Five, the decimal point is there. Now, since there's no numbers after the decimal point, see, I really don't even need it. So I make it invisible again. And then I simply add the percent sign. So I add the percent sign, and I'm finished. So now what have we done? We took one half, which says 1 divided by 2. I said one divided by two. I did that and it came out 0 0.50 because we always have two spaces after a decimal point when we're dividing. So that means now that one half is the same as 0 0.50 as a decimal. If I want to change that to a percent, I, wrote, I rewrote it and then you took step one, moved the decimal point two spaces and stopped. Then simply add a percent sign, and I'm all finished. So now we have two additional things that we can do. So I'm going to give you an example and see what happens. What if I have this percent? I have a decimal point, 82. And I say, what percent is that? You say this is really easy because I move the decimal point two spaces and I get 82 and add a percent sign and that's 82%. I'm finished. What about point 76? You say move the decimal point two spaces, I get 76 and add a percent sign. I'm finished. What if I said point zero seven six? You say no problem, you can't trick me. I move the decimal point two spaces is seven point six. The pins are not not doing right. Seven point six percent. So you you have it. The final thing I'm gonna mention right now, and then we're gonna stop for good for the day is what if you had you started with 82 percent I say you have 82 percent what is that as a decimal you say well 82 percent I got to 82 percent I already had a decimal so if I have to go backwards I go to step one, drop the percent sign, and move the decimal point two spaces to the left. So 82% becomes, and I know my 
even though I don't see it, my decimal point is here because it's invisible. So to change this to a percent, I drop the percent sign, I mean change it to a decimal, I drop the percent sign and move this decimal point two places. So I get point 82. Drop the percent sign, move this two spaces to the left. Because to change from this direction, I go two spaces to the right and add the percent sign. So to go the other way, I drop the percent sign and go two spaces to the left. So now, when you practice on your study island, you're going to get the opportunity to use these things. There's one thing we didn't mention, which is addition, the operations with decimals themselves. But we will come to that in the next lesson. So I'll prepare that for tomorrow. So study hard, go back over this, take your time, write down the vocabulary, write down the definitions, and write down the examples for yourself that you need in your notes. Remember, once you learn the vocabulary, once you learn the concepts, the rest of it is just practice and learning some tricks to use with certain kinds of things, just like you do on video games. You do it enough and you begin to realize that there's little tricks that you can use to master the game. So the same thing applies here. So study hard, be safe, and I'll see you tomorrow.